So in this video, I want to talk about Thrym's poem. Um, I'm going to start off with the uh, outline that Carolyn Larrington writes, as it's her translation. Um, she states it's a comedy, depends upon the characterization of Freya and Thor, who are compelled to act against their reputations. Freya is indignant when Loki and Thor suggest that she might marry a giant, though her reputation for promiscuity is such that taking a giant as a sexual partner might not be regarded as out of the question. Thor is the most masculine of the gods, and dressing up as a woman causes him acute embarrassment. Thrym, who has stolen Thor's hammer, is a giant with considerable social pretensions. And there's some commentary. Now, I've given this some thought, and I've given this some thought for some reasons. Um, not just sort of examining the poem, but looking at the roles that the characters involved in this represent, and how it's perhaps a guide or suggestion for how we should act or interact with each other. And there's a few really good debate points, I think. Points for having a good conversation about certain parts of the story. Now, the interesting thing about when Thor wakes up, actually there's a couple of things. One minor curiosity is there's no mention of Thor's wife Sif in this part of the story. However, the more important part of the story is perhaps completely omitted from the story because the suggestion is that Frim has managed to sneak into Asgard steal Miona and escape Asgard with no one being any the wiser until Thor awakens and discovers that Miona is missing. I was talking about this to my wife yesterday and she reached the same sort of conclusion I did, and, and probably a lot of other people are likely to reach in the, the damn you Loki sort of, or this smells of Loki. Though there's no mention at this stage of Loki, it's very much sort of, well, I'll get into it a little bit later as we go through sort of uh, the poem. Because obviously, first one, Thor wakes up, he's furious. He shook his beard. <sighs> Tossed his hair to and fro. And he begins to do that thing we probably all do when we're looking for something sort of... Where is it? Where is it? Um, Toolbox. So, verse 2, Thor confides in someone that his hammer is missing. And who does he confide in? Well, you guessed it. He doesn't confide in his wife, Sif, who you would imagine cohabit, not necessarily so, but doesn't confide in his father. You know, doesn't go to Heimdall, you know, the person who sees everything. No. Thor confides in Loki. And the two of them then decide to go and speak to Freya for help. And the help is to borrow her feather shirt to see if Thor can find his hammer. Now in verse 5, the interesting thing is Thor doesn't use it. It's Loki. Loki goes to search for Mjolnir. 
and he leaves Asgard and heads directly straight to Jotunheim. More importantly, he doesn't, well, it doesn't say he searches around Jotunheim looking for potential places where Miona might be. He goes straight to Frim. Um, who, as he approaches Frim, uh, he is displaying some of his wealth. And I think it's interesting to note that for Frim, to characterise Frim, is as Frim confesses, really, later on in the poem, he is immensely wealthy, likes to display his power and wealth, and seems very much to have all the... Well, I suppose what we consider the the masculine, the toxic traits of masculinity, or there is an argument for Frim being a misogynistic character in this poem. So anyway, Frim and Loki have an exchange where it's just like any news, says Frim. And Loki goes, there is news. And interestingly, and, and this is sort of, a, I suppose, how you choose to interpret the words. Loki says to Frim, have you hidden Thor's hammer? It is a question, but it's not a question that's accusing Frim in my belief, of having stolen the hammer. I think Loki knows exactly that Frim has the hammer, potentially because Loki has assisted in the theft of the hammer. It's more a case of, you have hidden it, right? I mean, this... <laughs> this feels very much for me the, the Anakin Skywalker and Padme meme, where it's just that sort of, you've done that thing, right? you You've hidden the hammer, right? With Anakin's look. Of course, Frim replies, it is hidden in a place no one is ever going to be able to get to it. And this is where I think sort of the misogynistic trait of Frim comes into play because Frim, Frim's terms is that he wants Freya for his wife. And on those terms, he will return Mjolnir. It's nothing to sort of, I don't know, court Freya or meet with Freya. It's Freya will be my wife. And those are the terms I will return my hammer, that return Thor's hammer. Which is... Let me just adjust that, because I don't like that. Um, they are what I consider sort of the self-entitled toxic masculine, masculine traits. So, of course, Loki has now heard the terms and returns to Asgard to pass on the message. And he meets Thor, and Thor does not allow Loki to land before sort of saying, uh, exposing what Loki has learned. There's a certain amount of mistrust towards Loki, naturally. Um, Thor is quite a straightforward god. We've got this throughout the Poetic Edda, that Thor is the one person. Thor is the one god who is straightforward, doesn't like deception, doesn't like people breaking their oaths or meanings, and he deals with it quite simply. It's, that's wrong. Bosch. 
So, obviously, Loki explains sort of uh, what the deal is, that he knows where the hammer is, but, or however, the only way the hammer will be returned is if Thor takes Freya to Flim so that Freya will become Flim's wife. So, <clears throat> again, in verse 12, the way I read this is Thor's like, okay, that's what's going to happen. We'll go speak to Freya and say, Good, get ready to um, get married, really. It's it's not really a debate. It's this is what we need to do because we need to get the hammer back. Naturally, and, and this is where I think some respect towards women is has that sort of aspect of representation in in this poem comes into play because it's assuming uh, and naturally Freya responds with fury and rage. Um, the whole hall of the Aesir trembles at that. Um, and, and let's just say, she's not in favour of this motion. So all the Aesir now gather to discuss uh, how they can get the hammer back. Verse 15, Heimdall makes a suggestion. I'll gloss over a bit of an unfortunate comment that follows, which is, to me, suggests that Heimdall is quite pure rather than the exact words, which is the whitest of the gods. I mean, that. But he does know the future, as do the Vanir too. And the suggestion is to dress four up as Freya and uh, see if they can dupe Frim into returning the hammer. Naturally, verse 17, four is resistant to this idea. And Frim's poem appears just after Locusena, and if you've read Locusena, there is some arguments, that means it's called Loki's argument, it's Loki bitching at everyone, but Odin and Loki have an exchange in that, where Loki is accused of being perverse, and Loki counters against Odin that you are also perverse for dabbling with women's magic so th there is this idea that men should not dabble with women's power or identity and let's say in writing verse 17 then said for the vigorous god the Assyria will call me perverse if i dress up as a woman Once more, Loki interjects, being the voice of reason. And as said, woven all through this tale, is Loki manipulating events. Be quiet, for don't speak these words. The giants will basically overrun Asgard if you don't get your hammer back. They have the the look. I know you don't want to do it. None of us want you to do it, but we need to get the hammer back. Because otherwise, if you don't get your hammer back, then the Jotnar are going to come into Asgard and take over the place. Things will not be good because you aren't prepared to dress up as a woman in order to get your hammer back. Naturally, for the purposes of getting his hammer back, for concedes and is dressed up as Freya. Now, 
what I think might get overlooked is there's no request put upon Loki. But of course, Loki has to stay in this story, manipulating this story, or whatever, unbidden, voluntarily. Loki agrees to go with Thor and goes as Thor's maid. And there's no suggestion that Loki dresses up as a maid. Because after this, Loki is no longer referred to as Loki. Loki becomes the shrewd maid. And I take that as Loki, as we, as we know, is does just shapeshifts, becomes a woman. Loki has this, or is not concerned about their gender. They are gender fluid. Um... And, and part of the reason for my motivation for doing this and reading the poem is there was a an article that I was was brought to my attention to read from uh, a gay publication that was claiming that Frim's poem is a four is queer story. I'm not against the discussion because as we get to the last part of the poem, I think there's an excellent discussion point for how far Thor might have been prepared to go to get his hammer back. But for inclusivity or as, as a story to include um, other sexual orientations or gender identities... This is a story that is primed to support being gender fluid or other such things. Because there's no real big deal about Loki just becoming the maid. They don't make a big deal of it. No one else makes a big deal of it. And it keeps them quite important to the final stretch of the poem so anyway we cut to Thor and Loki travel to Jotunheim um, there's a big point I suppose of Odin's son was driving to giant land and Frim is obnoxiously proud of the fact that the Aesir are bending to his will. They are bringing Freya to him to be his wife as he has demanded. And uh, they have a feast. And um, again, and this is this is where Sif actually does get a mention. Um, Four eats a whole ox, eight salmon, all the dainties meant for the women. And Sif's husband drinks free casks of mead. I'd also like to put in at this point as well, is, it is with Frim being this obnoxious, misogynistic, toxic, masculine figure. He's also a bit dumb, I mean... Or maybe accepting. It, it, there's, there's, I think there's two arguments there. And the, the second one I hadn't really considered. Because I was going first for... Wow, I must be really dumb to not realise that this... Bride is not actually Freya. Just, you know, four in disguise. Or perhaps, to Frim's credit. And obviously there's not... There's, discussion of how Jotun appear I suppose as well 
accepts that this, this, shall we say, butch female in her bridal gown and deception is female. I don't know. That's oh, perception and versus deception. It's it's a it's like the key thing to this story in many ways. But I suppose for him, really, as we see in his latter verses, he's like going, "Wow, I've never seen a woman eat so much, nor any girl drink so much mead." And obviously, Loki. Maintains the deception by speaking as the shrewd maid. Um, that Freya ate nothing for eight nights. So madly eager was she to come to Jotunheim. And I think sort of the suggestion is that uh, Frim accepts this. Or is perhaps get wants to get a little amorous with his bride-to-be. Um, and wants to kiss Freya and <laughs> I think it's quite funny really that that, that that Frim sort of bends under the headdress and sees these eyes <laughs> um uh, and and it's not just sort of like oh, it's from retreats halfway down the hall in fear of these eyes that fill him with terror it seems to me fire is burning from them there's a couple of things you can probably <laughs> take from this story is obviously four is probably uncomfortable uh, and angry being forced into this situation and i don't know there's, there's i suppose this is where it comes as comedy it, it's you've got a very masculine god in an uncomfortable situation and, and frim is sort of trying to kiss him and Thor is not really comfortable with that and Loki who is probably getting a lot of entertainment from this sort of intercepts again and it's just like Freya did not sleep for eight nights so madly eager was she to come to Jotunheim We don't get a response immediately from Frim following this. We're coming towards the end of the poem now. And in verse 29, Frim's sister, who apparently doesn't deserve a name, enters the scene and asks for a gift from the bride. Um, and basically saying, give me gifts if you want to merit my love, my love and all my favour. Give me gifts. If you want me to think well of you, you, I deserve gifts. And there's no real answer to that. So, at this time that gifts are being suggested, Frim calls for the hammer to be brought up um, to sanctify the bride, um, to confirm their marriage, and assumingly the way things work to a to finalise the marriage and to probably move towards the bedroom for the, the wedding night. Uh, and, and it's at this point that Mjolnir is, let's use my toolbox Marvel recreation of Mjolnir, is placed in the bride's lap, i.e. Thor's lap. What is then said in verse 31, Thor's heart laughed in his breast when he, stern in courage, recognised the hammer. It's that sort of 
goal achieved. The deception has worked. I have my hammer. And what does he do? Well, <laughs> Frim doesn't get to partake in his story any further because the first person to die at Four's hands is Frim. And then Four goes about beating the absolute snot out of all the Jotun that are there. Um, in particular, it notes that he kills the sister who had asked for the gift from the bride. Um, nothing else is said of Loki. And the story concludes, so Odin's son got the hammer back. don't really see this as a queer story as the article in question says it is. I think there's a good debate to be had about how far we can think for might have gone. What would he have gone through to get me on it back if he had taken the wedding night? to get access to Mjolnir. It's a very good debate point. Do we think Thor would have slept with Frim in order to get Mjolnir back? I mean, at the end of the day, the story does not play out that way. But it, I think it's, it's worth having a sensible and polite debate about whether that could have happened. I mean, Loki has seeded the idea that they have to get the hammer back. Thor has to suffer these indignities, or what he perceives to be indignities, to get the hammer back. How far would Thor have gone? It's like, there's, there is a lot of credible reasoning but the gods can take the shapes they want um, but four is quite straightforward and it would make sense for four if he's able to adjust his form to do so to make the deception more convincing but clearly four does not do that um, so I think that's, that is a good debate point, but it, I'm not convinced myself that Thor would have gone through with it. Who knows? It's not the way the story goes. Um, what I find the most intriguing is Loki's part throughout the story. And that there's no comment against Loki switching form and gender. Um, there's no issue. And that is important to remember, to champion, to discuss that while Loki might not be completely honest about their involvement in the story they are helping out and there's no big issue made about whether they're male or female or gender fluid they do what they want and no one batters an eyelid and that's good that is good so I feel Ultimately, there are a lot of things on display in this story. You've got good masculinity and I suppose I would say a a healthy heterosexual marriage between Thor and his wife. I do find it disappointing that Sif isn't or doesn't have a greater part in the story. But again, it's not how it's written or how the translation is. Um, it's 
it's just these roles. Freya is there as a feminine figure who is asked to do something that's not necessarily pleasant, um, maintains her dignity. Um, And obviously it becomes a big issue for the Aesir, the importance of Mjolnir and getting it back. One of the comments I want to drop into this is if this is, well, it's not a queer story. It's a story. And in comparison, the article, how it was written, might as well suggest that Nuns on the Run is a queer story or a queer film, which is not, it's a comedy. The thing that has been I don't know, my purpose to critique the article. I wouldn't normally have read it. And it's unfortunate, it's disappointing that it's an article that appears to want to promote sort of division. In the same way we, we can observe and acknowledge that there are a lot of articles that appear in mainstream media that seem intent on stirring up trouble and causing division that this article seems to be intent on doing the same thing in its target community rather than encouraging debate as said the de real debate point from a queer perspective is how far would four have gone and that can be a debate where no one has to get upset it can just be discussed it's just like well it's possible maybe not it's possible maybe not no one has to sort of insult other sides of the debate it can just be discussed because there's the story that's creating debate points and that's that's the thing that we need to acknowledge and try to do better if we want to be inclusive we have to include all parties and communicate with respect uh, and discuss things in a way that you're not insulting people. This was the first story used in that article and it suggests to me that the writer of the article is probably copying someone else's homework and hasn't read the story itself because they get their angles I feel monumentally wrong to just support an agenda they want to push that when you read it is provocative having sort of seen the conversations that followed after the posting of the article it created division and unfortunately the people who was insulted most by the article did not respond in a fashion that was necessary because they went straight for insults and expletives and had to be dealt with. 
And unfortunately, on the other side, the supporters of the article, there were unflattering responses that were fueled by the article and its div div divisiveness. Um, and it, to observe it, it's quite sad to see that as you, as a community, as you try to be inclusive, the judgment and sort of efforts to maintain a, a sense of peace and honest debate means should we call it a, a, a homophobic response is shut down and, and cancelled muted um, however it's noticeable that after some calls for sensible comments the Opposing side, the inclu inclusive side, the 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 LGBTQ side, continued to make derogatory comments, and you then, or there was then no moderation against them um, when perhaps they should also be informed or advised to conduct the debate in a more civil manner because really if you want to continue making derogatory comments even if you're not using expletives you are still making derogatory comments and they do not further a conversation. And it's disappointing for me, observing it, that there's almost a silent authority given to them that they can say what they want because they will not get moderated or perhaps that the moderation team are afraid of criticising these people. These people are free to criticise, even though they are being rude or derogatory, and not wanting to be able to, or feeling that they are... <laughs> They cannot be criticised because as a group, as a whole, we are trying to be inclusive. So the homophobes, rightly so to some extent, get punished and dealt with. But other people continuing a disrespectful or argumentative slant do not get moderated they are free to say what they want without fear of being dealt with that's not a good way to bring education on these points together because it creates imbalance and targets and removes power from the people who are meant to be there to encourage good debate, earnest debate, support. Support has to work. It has to be inclusive. For me, inclusivity includes everyone is brought together and held accountable equally. You can't have one side 
being able to throw insults and get away with it, but come down hard on another group who use insults and are moderated, that is unfortunate. It's easily done. I've experienced it many times in different sort of circumstances. Unfortunately, my experience is there are people who, if they are of a certain minority, they are, and I guess it's a form of discrimination in a negative positive way or positive negative way in that an authority will not take action against a group because they know they will get a defense of you are picking on me because I'm in a minority you can't do that I will claim that I am this minority and that is your motive for targeting me when really if your actions your deeds are not honorable in particular in talking about this faith it doesn't matter what your demographic is if you're acting inappropriately you should be called out on it and if that means you have to be moderated you have to be silenced because you are acting inappropriately that has to happen that has to happen equally you have to moderate a group equally really going back to the whole article it wasn't targeted for a general group it was targeted for a minority but that minority brought it to the general group um, and I think it was interesting to read it I also think unfortunately you'll always get people that don't want to they don't want to read the poetic ghetto they want to read someone's details of how they have translated the poetic ghetto as said if you have an influential person saying Frim's poem is a for is queer story there's gonna be and there'll always be a certain amount of people who go right well yeah it's a queer story for is queer and not read it can't do anything about that but if you are someone who wants to know about these things then you can only do yourself the favor in reading it in many ways there is a the article is good because it achieves a goal of suggesting that Sartre, heathenry, Norse paganism is and can be inclusive. But do it in the right way. Bring people in and debate it. Make it a could for be queer. And said, how far would four have gone to get his hammer back? And that is a great debate. No one's ego needs to be bruised or bashed by having that conversation. More importantly for me is the way in which Loki just is gender fluid and no one batters an eyelid. We make these sort of things ordinary, acceptable. There's nothing special about Loki's gender because it's Loki. 
and the gods either love or hate Loki for who Loki is, not for what gender they are. And when we can come together to talk about those things in those ways, we can hopefully reach a true level of inclusivity where everyone gets to say what they want and no one has their feelings hurt because we have bigger problems than being offended by someone's sexual orientation, identity, or colour of their skin. Who is the person? Let's talk to the person. Let's educate each other and make the community as best as it can be. I don't think I'm ever going to be entirely sure if I've said these things the way that's best. Well, I hope, if you're still watching this and haven't got rid of, got rid of me in an angry way, is that we can work together to make a better community. But we all have to be held accountable by the same rules. No one gets special treatment other than the special treatment we give each other. And that starts with good debate and no one having to feel that their ego is being bruised. I hadn't planned to delve into Frim's poem so deeply this week or these, these last couple of weeks or since seeing that article in particular um, I was aware of it I had read through it I've now sort of excuse me gone deeper into it and it's welcoming to explore the possibilities within the story um that's what we need to do and not get angry at an opinion I'm not angry at the article there's some things in there that are not right in when you read the poetic edda but the article doesn't offer in my memory um any room for a different opinion anyway Frim's poem and uh, let's take care be inclusive talk and remember we are our deeds and the gods can be what they want to be. Not what we want them to be. They'll be what they want to be. Thank you very much. Goodbye.